They spray our skies Interact with these with the magnetic toxic chemicals. Hi, I'm Rich Lund, and welcome to another episode of Debunk the Funk. I'd like to start today with a very simple demonstration. Here, I have a glass of water, and I'm going to put a drop of green food coloring into it. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of straight bleach to my green colored water. Okay, we just observed green colored water, when bleach was added, turn into blue colored water. Why? One possible hypothesis is that the green food coloring is composed of green molecules and that when the bleach is added it chemically reacts with those green molecules to turn them into some type of blue molecule. It's a pretty simple explanation and it does fit the evidence. However, we could offer an alternative hypothesis. Green food coloring isn't made out of green molecules but instead is a mixture of two chemicals one that is comprised of blue molecules and one that's comprised of yellow molecules. When the bleach interacts with it, it actually reacts with the yellow molecules only to turn them into some other colorless chemical. The blue molecules remain unaffected by the bleach. So we see blue not because green changed to blue, but because the green was always blue and yellow and the yellow changed to colorless. That hypothesis, while just a little bit more complex than the first one, it still fits all the evidence and it is still quite plausible. So we have two competing hypotheses here. They both are fairly simple and they both fit the evidence. If we really want to know more about what's going on, we might need to devise an experiment that could falsify or disprove one of these hypotheses. A simple chromatography experiment might just do the trick. If we take some green food coloring and we place it onto some paper and then let water crawl up the paper, it'll take the green food coloring with it. If the green food coloring is comprised of just one green chemical, then that green food coloring will smear all the way up the paper. But if the green food coloring is actually comprised of two chemicals, one that's blue, one that's yellow, well those two chemicals probably have a different density to them, a different molecular weight. Whichever one is more dense won't crawl up with the water as much, and the one that's less dense will actually travel up with the water the full way. So we'll get a smearing that'll separate out those two colors. This experiment does have the power to falsify or disprove one of these hypotheses. Let's run the experiment. Nice line of green food coloring. I'm going to place it into the water and let her run. We'll speed up the camera so we don't have to sit through the whole thing. And let's take a look at the results. It would appear that at the top of our separation we have some distinct blue. And near the bottom we definitely have some yellow it's even more apparent when we hold it up to the light. With both blue and yellow present, most would rationally conclude here that we can reject the green molecule hypothesis. That the green food coloring really is a mixture of blue and yellow chemicals. But what if after this experiment, and after we've seen this evidence, there's still a person or even a group of people that are holding and clinging on to the green molecule hypothesis. And in fact, they say it's still correct that the green food coloring truly is just a bunch of green molecules. They love the green hypothesis. They're very comfortable with it. They've believed it for years. They've watched many YouTube videos about it. So after seeing this experiment, they add on something to the green molecule hypothesis, something to keep it alive. They revise their idea, and they say that, yes, the green food coloring still is all green molecules. But these molecules, when they come into contact with the coffee filter paper that I used, they actually decompose into blue and yellow molecules. And so when you perform this chromatography experiment, you had green molecules at the beginning, but when you put them on the paper, they became, only then, blue and yellow molecules. And so, of course, when we separate them with the chromatography, it looks as if they've always been just blue and yellow molecules. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what's known as an ad hoc hypothesis. An ad hoc hypothesis is one that has been changed or altered with something added to it to keep it from being disproven. And it usually makes the idea even more complex. Now, ad hoc itself isn't necessarily always a problem or a signal that deception is afoot. 
In history, many well-established scientific theories have had to be edited or revised or tweaked a little bit when new evidence that didn't make sense at first has presented itself. But in science, when ad hoc is used, it's done so in a way that fits the evidence and can be falsified. The added part can immediately be put to the test and see if it really does belong in that theory or if that theory really should be rejected. Let's say we're good sports and we decide, okay, maybe we should put our food coloring through some more testing. We realize that if it is a mixture of two different colored molecules, well, there's more than one way to separate them out from each other. So we take a sample of it and we put it through a centrifuge process. Now, I don't have such equipment here, but pretend along with me. We put a sample of our food coloring into a centrifuge, which will spin it around at a very high speed. More dense molecules will move outward or to the bottom of a test tube in a centrifuge. Meanwhile, the less dense molecules, they will move upward, more so just because they're getting pushed out of the way by the more dense molecules. We run the centrifuge and we take out our sample and when it's done, the yellow molecules are down near the bottom and the blue molecules are up near the top. The proponents of the green molecule hypothesis, though, they're not having any of it. They revise their hypothesis yet again. They ad hoc a bit more and they revise their statement. They say that actually the green molecules, they are such an unstable chemical that under many different extreme conditions of force or acceleration or velocity, they will actually decompose into the blue and yellow molecules. There's many ways besides just contact with coffee filter paper that can cause this to happen. A further, even more complicated ad hoc hypothesis is born. I touched on this idea with ever really calling it by name in Debunk the Funk number three where I invoked the fictional group of the turtle deniers. I explained in that episode how if a person or a group of people don't like the way evidence is showing their idea to be disproven, well, there's no limit to how much ad hoc they can add on to a hypothesis to keep it on life support. So how can we discern when is ad hoc being used in a responsible, scientific way versus when it's being used to keep some idea on life support that probably should be rejected? The first thing to ask is, is the ad hoc falsifiable? Whether it's an easy or a difficult experiment, still, could an experiment be set up that would have the power to disprove the added ad hoc idea? If someone says that the green molecules are just so unstable that just about anything you do to try to investigate if they really are green molecules causes them to break down into blue and yellow molecules, well, that added idea isn't really falsifiable you can't do anything to test it out definitively. It's immune from testing. Next, how much ad hoc is really going on? I already mentioned that plenty of scientific theories and ideas have been edited and revised over time. And in fact, that willingness to take in new evidence and change the ideas and tweak them, that's something that gives science the very power that it has. But at the same time, when science does tweak or revise its ideas, it immediately does its best to test out that added idea, to resolve the issue. When pseudoscience uses ad hoc ideas, well, they create them in such a way that they are either unfalsifiable or that if they are later on disproven, well, just more ad hoc gets added on to still try to keep that idea alive. You can sometimes find an entire string of ad hocs that have been attached to each other to help keep alive the previous ad hoc. The flat earth idea is full of tremendous amounts of ad hoc. That somehow visual perspective works differently, magically somehow, at the horizon. And that's why you somehow cannot see the bottom half of the sun during a sunset while the top half remains completely in view. Or that it's not the earth that causes the shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse, but it's some mysterious invisible object in the sky that we can never otherwise see. In Debunk the Funk episode number two, I showed pretty succinctly with an experiment that anybody could replicate that the sun's visual diameter does not change at three different times during the day. Early in the morning, midday, and at dusk, the visual diameter of the sun was the same. This evidence I collected flies in the face of the flat earth idea that the sun is relatively close to us and just moves around in a circle above us. If such were true, then the visual diameter of the sun should change throughout the day as it moves first towards us and then away from us on its circular path above our heads. One commenter on that video claimed that it was because of the atmosphere between the sun and the viewer and that the more atmosphere you have, the more it will magnify the size of the sun. That 
even though the flat earth idea would say that the sun just after sunrise is quite far away from the viewer compared to where it would be around noon, that the atmosphere magnifies the size of the sun and that it does so in just the right way so that way it seems to be the exact same size as when it's closer to you. When an idea has a large amount, a large number of ad hocs, and one or more or many are not falsifiable, well then you're probably dealing with pseudoscience and a junk idea. Next, when you are dealing with those junk ideas, well, the ad hoc usually will create one or more very convenient coincidences. What if we take our separated chromatography results, and now that we've separated the two colors, we add a little bit of bleach? Let's see what happens. Look at that. The yellow is bleached away. Meanwhile, the blue seems to remain pretty well intact. This certainly only further supports the blue and yellow hypothesis, and that when the bleach was added to the green, it was really just changing the yellow into a colorless molecule, and the blue remain unaffected. But the green hypothesis proponents, they would be forced to have to say that no, the green molecule changed into a blue and yellow molecule when it touched the paper, and it's just a coincidence that the new yellow molecule happens to be one that will be cleared by bleach, and the blue one just happens to be an unaffected molecule. Likewise, when that commenter tried to explain my experiment as being just an atmospheric magnification of the sun, so that way it only appeared to be the exact same size as it was at noon, well, that is quite the coincidence. And just for the record, when light passes through the atmosphere, it can be bent or refracted, but it is not magnified. But not only was this claim being made that that does happen, but that also it just happens to be magnified to the exact size it needs to be to look the same throughout any time of the day. And if the atmosphere did magnify things in this way, well then, if you have an object that's 10 meters away, and then put it 100 meters away, and then put it 500 meters away, it would always look the same size. Looking at objects in the distance would be the same as if you were looking at them close up. You wouldn't be able to tell just relatively how far away anything is. And the last one I'll bring up, when ad hoc is being used to try to save a bunk idea, well, the only evidence for the ad hoc is usually just the experiment itself that caused the ad hoc to be necessary in the first place. With the green food coloring molecule hypothesis, the only evidence that they would decompose when they come into contact with paper was the chromatography experiment that showed we're not dealing with just green molecules. When it came to this atmospheric magnification ad hoc that the commenter brought up, the only evidence that the commenter could offer of this magnification effect was my experiment. We don't ever see this atmospheric magnification effect with anything else. Hot air balloons, airplanes, skylines. Some could, I suppose, try to make the claim that the moon has this same atmospheric magnification effect, but it would be pretty quick to see that this would be burdened with the same problems as trying to explain the sun that way. No object that we all agree is moving away from us is ever magnified by the atmosphere and definitely not in such a way that it appears to be the same size as when it's closest to us. So to review, when sifting through the different ways that an idea has explained or answered the questions that you have for it, when you encounter ad hoc, ask these questions. Is the ad hoc falsifiable? Is there an experiment that could be set up that would have the power to disprove the ad hoc? Next, are multiple ad hocs being invoked? When an ad hoc is tested and disproven, is that the end of it, or does suddenly a new ad hoc just get invented on the spot to try to keep the idea on life support? Third, does the ad hoc or ad hocs used, do they create certain very special, very convenient coincidences that must exist in order for the idea to still work? And fourth, is there any independent evidence that can be used to support the ad hoc idea, or is the only evidence for it the very thing that caused the ad hoc to be needed in the first place? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hey, give it that thumbs up. If this one ruffled your feathers, well, then the thumbs down is right next to it. I'm Rich Lund, and I'm here to remind you, the world needs critical thinkers. Make sure that you're one of them. See you next time.